I uh, introduced her evil twin this morning, uh, but I'm very relieved that uh, the real deal is here this afternoon, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our principal speaker, speaker Dr. Tori Herridge, uh, evolutionary biologist at the University of Sheffield, mammoth expert and broadcaster. Come on up. The thing about evil twins is you never actually know whether you've got the evil one or the good one. So <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for welcoming me back to Solway on an absolutely beautiful day. Um, I'm actually going to start with mammoths because that's what I know about. And now, thanks to Nick, oh my goodness. <laughs> You did this. <laughs> um, thanks to Nick, I have a reason to talk about mammoths here in the Solway, because, of course, he turned up a mammoth bone a few years back. Um, this here is not the Solway Firth. This is the Indigurka River in eastern Siberia. Now, the last time I was here in the Solway was September 2018, and I came here directly after having been there on this river. Now, this river runs from north to south, from the Laptev Sea up in the Arctic, through right the way down through Siberia. And that's where basically the people living in these very remote regions get their stuff. Things go from the sea up north and then down through there. Fuel comes in, food comes in, trade goes backwards and forwards to the big city hubs like Yakutsk, which are far into the continental centre, and then up to the north and then down another river and then up and then down another river, yeah, all the way through Russia, effectively. And because of that, they are trade hubs. They are conubations. They're where people live alongside them. And... This little boat here is the ferry that leaves a town called Belayagora. And Belayagora is the administrative centre of the Abyssky region of the Saka Republic in this area, the Indigurka River. And this boat we hired for the expedition that we were on to go in search of probably the newest and most recent economic development in the area. Now, as you can see, it's a very beautiful, beautiful, big river. As you head up it and turn off into its tributaries, the tributaries get smaller and smaller. Now, this particular year had been a very low sea, le the sea where very low, uh, blah, blah, a very low river level year, and um, you couldn't get particularly far along the tributaries. So we went along these tributaries in small boats, not the big boats, obviously, further and further and further, and the tributaries got smaller and smaller and smaller until basically the water ran out. And at that point, you had to get out of the boats and you had to walk. And I say walk. When I say walk, I actually mean wade. And you live in the Solway. You all know what sticky river mud is like. Now, this is sticky river mud that is basically permafrost, permafrost slurry. Um, it's the end of the summer. It's August. It's not super warm, but it's not super cold yet either. Fortunately, most of the mosquitoes have gone. It's not too bad. If we'd been there a few months earlier, we would have had to have... They basically dealt with swarms of them and black fly. You get so many black flies sometimes in those regions that they crowd the eyes and the nose of the reindeer, and reindeer have been known to die um, from suffocation. It wasn't so bad when we were there, but the mud was sticky, and we had to carry all of our kit for quite some distance. And as we did so, what we passed was something that had I been in that situation in this country, I would have stopped every other step, because the ground was absolutely littered, and I mean like littered, because it was dumped there by people, actually, um, with mammoth bones, with woolly rhino bones, with ancient bison bones and ancient horse bones. I mean, so many fossils. You were literally like, okay, another mammoth, another mammoth. Oh, <laughs> a woolly rhino. I mean, you, if you did that in the UK, you wouldn't have moved, because you would have stopped and you would have just just been in absolute incredulity at the riches at your feet. But that wasn't why we were there. We were there in search of something bigger. Just like other people who were exploiting this new economic opportunity. Because alongside those riverbanks, you would pass in their pairs or sometimes slightly bigger groups of mostly men, in fact, I think all men, um, 
the people with hoses and sometimes a little like tarp tent or, or if they were lucky, an actual tent and usually a small boat and uh, kind of a jerry can of petrol. And that's pretty much all they had. Um, but they were blasting the sides of the riverbank with these super high powered hoses. And the reason they were doing that was because in the riverbanks, can you see there's a sort of a, a shape here? That is the scapula of a mammoth. And this little lump here is actually a mammoth foot that is bobbing around. And when I say foot, I mean foot. It had flesh and toenails and muscle and a bit of fur coming out of the riverbank. They weren't after the feet. They were in search of tusks because the biggest development in that area at the moment is tusk hunting. And because tusks are made of ivory, Mammoth tusks are made of ivory. Mammoth tusks are bigger than African elephant tusks. They can <laughs> reach meters in length and like 50, 100 kilograms in weight. And if you find a really beautiful pair of mammoth tusks of that size, you can get $50,000 for it on the free market. And that is considerably more than you will earn from an average job, say, in Balayagora or Yakutsk. Now, not all the tusk hunters were as uh, indiscriminate as the ones I showed you there. This is um, Boris Bev Brevnikov and Spartak Habrov. And they are two best mates who were, not anymore, they had some good luck. They were telecoms engineers in Yakutsk. And they thought, you know what, we're not earning very much money, so we'll try our hand at tusk hunting for a season. And they struck lucky, and they found mammoth ivory, and it made their fortunes, and made their family rich, and they could buy a nice house and a nice car and send their kids to good schools, and you know, all those kind of great things. In the middle is Luva Dalen, um, who took a lot of the photographs. He's an ancient DNA expert from Sweden and who came on the expedition with me. And um, Boris and Spartak, because they were quite successful and coming back every season, had a very, like a des res, you might call it, of tusk hunters. No single tarp for them, no sort of small jerry can of oil. They had like a full-on camp, but, you know, like, you know, hooks for their mugs, you know, that kind of thing. Um, a nice little setup, and they would sort of play host to the other less fortunate tusk hunters and sort of, you know, preside over the, the sort of the region. And they were absolutely delightful people. They even had a sauna up the hill, which it was very nice to spend some time in. And because I was, um, at that point, just entering my second trimester of pregnancy, uh, it was very concerning to uh, my Russian colleagues because it's a different culture there. Um, and so I had to spend a lot of time in that sauna. <laughs> Shame. Um, but this is Boris and Spartak's tunnel. So this is their tunnel where they basically were going in search of mammoth ivory. Now, that's not a natural cave. They are carving that out of the permafrost using their hoses. And what they would do is they would identify an ice wedge in the permafrost. These are sort of natural ice wedges that form in these glacial landscapes, these ice age landscapes. And in this area, those ice wedges have been frozen for tens of thousands of years. And the reason why you don't want an ice wedge is because if you find mammoth ivory in an ice wedge, it won't be stained by the sediment in the permafrost. And therefore, it looks white and beautiful and makes more money. They call it icy ivory. It's what you're after. And um, Boris and Spartak were very, very good at following what they call the river of ice into the side of the, t of the permafrost. It's very, very, very dangerous in there. So we were in there, we had all kinds of like temperature equipment, like monitoring the temperature, because at any moment, the whole thing could collapse. It does happen, people do die. And... Um, it looks small there, but very soon it opened out. And as you walked into it, the ceiling of this kind of cathedral-like chamber would be sparkling with frost crystals, and there'd be just sort of just in the ceiling like a rhino skull sort of looking down at you, and bones everywhere. And there was even sort of levels where you could see grass, sort of grass layers that were still green. Now, this is like ancient Ice Age grass layers within that permafrost. And that kind of place turns up remarkable things. Yes, ivory, but also stuff that people like Boris and Spartak aren't financially interested in, although they, like, they are interested in it, um, but have to give to the um, scientists from Yakutsk, because that's the deal. They can use hoses, they get a license if they give their bycatch to the researchers in Yakutsk. So this is a woolly mammoth ear <laughs> in a piece of woolly mammoth skin from Boris and Spartak's tunnel, like that. It's about that big. This 
is a bird, obviously, that looks like it could have flown into their tunnel yesterday. Uh, we took some samples for ancient DNA. Uh, Louva analyzed them with his lab. It turned out to be a horned lark. And we took some samples of radiocarbon dating. It's between 44 and 49,000 years old. Uh, remember those numbers. They're going to come back to you in a second. Uh, this is a moth. So Boris and Spartak got quite into these little extra things, and they are really careful and really good at it, and they've got really sharp eyes, so Spartak spotted a moth, turned his hose off and collected it. I mean, this is the sort of thing that if you aren't doing it like that, it all gets us like smushed into the slurry. But this moth, 41 to 45,000 years old, don't forget the fact that there were moths and butterflies flying around in the Ice Age as well, flies and mosquitoes, and all those kind of things that we don't put in our dioramas usually. And this is Spartak, <laughs> or Sparta, because actually it turned out to be a girl. Um, and this is a baby cave lion that was found. I know, it's 27,000 years old, a bit younger. It was actually called Spartak because the previous year they'd found another cave lion cub, and Boris found that one. That one got called Boris, and so yeah, it was only fair that Spartak got one too. Look at it, just close up. It's so cute. Look at those little eyes. So because I was pregnant at the time, I started to call my baby bump Spartak. And um, he didn't get called Spartak in the end, although I sort of regret that. But he did come out looking kind of furry and fuzzy, a bit like, you know, with golden hair, a bit like a cave lion. So who knows? Anyway, um, Boris was actually also 44,000 years old. So actually, whilst they were find found very close to each other, they weren't like siblings. They weren't two cubs in a den together. They were actually two different groups. And we think in this tunnel, there's exact, there was probably actually two layers of Ice Age material. And that grass layer was actually representing one older layer and then this younger one, which Sparta came from above it. And then other camps elsewhere had this. This is a Beringian wolf head. Not from the same cave. We don't know how old it is yet, but Louvre's working on it. I mean, really, what I'm trying to point out is this Ice Age area, this Ice Age fauna, we call it these animals that lived 40,000 odd years ago, can still be found in places like Siberia in absolutely pristine condition. Now, I'm not saying that to you to make you feel like Solway's a bit rubbish because it's not. <laughs> I'm saying it's you just to tell you a little bit and give you a real sense of the animals that were living across Eurasia in this time period, 45 to 46,000 years ago. Mammoths, woolly rhino, herds of horses, herds of reindeer, uh, muskox, wolves, cave lions, hyena. Like these animals were everywhere and they were also here. Now, Nick found a mammoth not so far from here. The dates from that are also about the same age as these creatures here, so around about 46,000 years ago. And what's really interesting about that is that that marks a time period during the Ice Age where things got a little bit warmer. Not warm, warmer. So to give you that context of how climate has changed in the past, this is a temperature curve. So I think warm up here, cold down here, like that. And this is... 20 million years ago, it's got a funny, sort of, you know, squished up scale, so 5 million years ago. In the 5 million years ago, you start to really see this pattern, yeah, of things going from being quite nice and warm to getting much, much colder until you hit what we think of as the Ice Age. And then you get this period where you go basically from warm to cold, 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 um, every 100,000 years. And in particular, that happens over the last 800,000 years. So you want to zoom in on it. From every 800,000 years, you go basically from a warm period to a cold period to a warm period to a cold period to a warm period to a cold period, blah, 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 just like that every 100,000 years. And 40,000 years ago pops you up here. Now, we use these things called marine isotope stage stages. Even ones are cold, odd ones are warm. So we're currently in a nice warm one, number one. Right? And uh, our little mammoth from Solway and that one well, of the old cave lions, the moth, the lark, all come from a period called stage three. Now, stage three is here, also known as the Middle Devensium, about 40 to 50,000 years ago. And that, on that little cold hot chart, is around about here. So it's not warm like today, like we're up here. It's certainly not as warm as it was 125,000 years ago, but it's warmer than it would be in a full glaciation. So, if you were to come to Solway 
40 odd thousand years ago, 45,000 years ago, you wouldn't be under an ice sheet. You'd be in a landscape that was much more akin to something you might be familiar with or if you've seen nature documentaries or even been lucky enough to go somewhere like Alaska. So think about a tundra region, maybe with some braided rivers, sort of, you know, running fast, sort of, you know, in and out of each other, sort of very few trees, sort of small shrub-like things, alders and dwarf willows, and animals like mammoth. Animals like probably woody rhino, animals probably like bison and reindeer and things like that, and maybe that little moth or a horned lark. So that's the kind of landscape you've got to imagine when you think of Solway four to 6,000 years ago. And the reason why I like to imagine that is because when I come to places like Solway, that's what I have in my mind. So when I came here, oh, I forgot to show you about the ice sheets, that comes later. So later you get the whole area covered in ice, the last glacial maximum, sort of 27 to 25,000 years ago. And then all that's gone, everything is super, super cold and a kilometre under, probably, in most places. Now, so when I come here, I was lucky enough to do so a month after I went to Siberia, but to do it in the guise of presenting a TV programme. Now, I've really badly edited all of the beautiful drone shots out of Britain at low tide, just so I could have them as a backdrop and you could all enjoy them whilst I'm talking. There's no sound, you can just have a heavy weight, you've got to pay attention, unless you want to spot your friends, because I'm really rubbish at editing things, and there's definitely some people still in there. Um, shout out if you spot yourself. So when I got to come here and make Britain at low tide, yeah, I got to see this. Now, I stuck around this, and I see this landscape, and I'm there, yes, I've got to make a TV programme, yes, I'm here to talk about archaeology and meet amazing people, but I also am looking around, having the joy of thinking about a landscape that is full of deeper, longer histories. And at that point, I was not aware there was a mammoth, but I was thinking about it, because I was aware that there were bone caves up in Ascent that I had the pleasure of visiting for other programmes and that I knew were full of interesting Ice Age creatures and bears and things like that. And I knew there's mammoth material from Scotland elsewhere. And I know there's mammoths in Britain 40 odd thousand years ago. In fact, the Britain of 40 odd thousand years ago, we, we've got plenty of archaeology. You know, Neanderthals are probably there from 60,000 years ago onwards. We've got Kent's Cavern, which is um, there's a, a upper jawbone there of our own species dated to 42,000 years ago. So 46,000 years ago is a really interesting time period, right? Because were, were Neanderthals there? Ooh, maybe. Were our own species there? Ooh, maybe. They might have been the presence of people sort of ephemerally, intermittently moving through the landscape alongside the mammoths and yeah, in this kind of big, cold, kind of Alaskan-style environment. Nothing like this kind of sawway, open firth of long, low, like, like sort of long, Sort of mirage like vistas, um, but you can still see the imprints of those later ices shaping the valleys, right? That everything, all the archaeology that we're looking at is effectively working with him. And then you start to think about the landscape itself. And oh, look, what seaweed is that, everybody? <laughs> I've heard there's a really good book. <laughs> Surely you can identify that one, Nick. You must be able to. Um, so, sorry, I lost my train of thought then. Um, yeah, you, you sort of see this whole landscape that has basically defined the way things like that archaeology has come to be. Because, of course, the geology, the shape of the land, the shape of the landforms, the type of rocks, what you have available in your catchment define the kind of industries that take off, that work. So you look at something like the Sawway Viaduct, and you, you, know, you see that story of the viaduct, but you also start to think, well, where did those rocks come from? You look at the Palfoot swimming pool, and you know, you're seeing the other end of that, the archaeological story, which is you know, the, it, so many industries have maybe stopped that suddenly tourism becomes something that is new and important. But of course, it's sitting there within that long, low, like massive tidal range estuary that is determined by the shape of a valley that's been carved out by an ice sheet in the first place. So, quite excited. I do love this region. Um, and the thing I really love about it is that you also start to think about connectivity. Because the thing I loved about working on Britain Low Tide in general is we did so many river estuaries, not just Solway. And what's great about river estuaries is you have this connection between shores that is often stronger across a river, bizarrely, than it almost is between the river folk and the inland highland folks on either side, which I really like because of the industry connections as well. But what's particularly, I think, special about the Solway is the story of connections across the south and the north 
of the estuary is something that seems to sort of mimic this massive, big story of the evolution of the continents of our planets, the origins of the British Isles itself. Because yeah, you're here on the junction between, I'm <laughs> marking that junction, between the rocks that came together at the closing of a major ocean 480 million years ago that effectively created Britain. So, 480 million years ago, you have these big mega continents of Gondwana and Laurentia, and they're separated by the, uh, the Iapetus Ocean, like that. And then, you know, a small time later, just 30 million years or so, um, yeah, a lot has changed. Like Britain is right down here, well, Britain, England and Wales and a bit of Ireland. It's right down here in the Arctic Circle. You see South Pole's here on the Arctic Circle. And Scotland and the north of Ireland is right up here, just south of the equator, so in the tropics, like that. Now, slowly, 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 a bit of land that has Britain and you know, sort of England, Wales and Southern Ireland on it moves northwards. And we talk about the closure of this ocean. Now, that sounds all very static. It eventually ends up closing the ocean 420 million years ago, which all sounds very static when you talk about it with maps and things like that, but of course it wasn't. The tectonic activity that creates that kind of movement, the forces that bring continents together build mountains. And when you look at the rocks, around Dumfries and Lochaber and Lockerbie, that you see these things, you might see in a geological guide, oh, it's um, Silurian turbidites, right? Ty turbidites are an underwater avalanche, like an underwater avalanche. Yeah, it's what happens when there's a massive underwater avalanche or landslip because things are moving. Earthquakes are moving, continents are moving, and things are collapsing and spinning, and sediment is moving and creating these turbidite rocks that poke up now on the hillsides around Lockerbie, and that is basically telling you about that movement. It's showing you that things were moving, oceans were closing, and mountains, ranges like the Himalayas that once stood around here and are now long gone because 400 million years has passed, uh, yeah, were there once and started to define that landscape. From there, the next set of history, of course, you have in this area, and the biggest geological unit you start to see, is when you have this mega continent, Pangaea, Permian into the Triassic. Now, you can see where the newly connected, although it's not a thing at that time, just drawn it in in red, where the British Isles and Ireland are. Right here on the equator in the middle of a supercontinent. And when you're in a supercontinent, you get massively hot, dry interiors. And at that point, what is now Britain was in the middle of a great big desert. A desert where sand was blowing, there were some rivers. It wasn't completely inhospitable. Reptiles scuttled across the sand and dragged their tails behind them and left their footprints in the rocks. And of course, that beautiful red sandstone is what now builds the buildings that we have in Carlisle. It's what makes the blocks that built the Solway Viaduct. It's what defines the colour scheme of everything we look at. And you know, it's there like, from deserts 300 million years ago. Oh, I skipped on a bit too far. Sorry, I skipped a bit here. And then I've, oh, I know what I've missed. I'm sorry, guys. And then, of course, you get the Carboniferous. And the Carboniferous comes along later. And Britain's now at the tropics. And there's swamplands replacing those deserts. And in those swamplands, trees are sinking. And the trees, of course, eventually turn to coal. So you've got the material, the sandstones that build our buildings, you've got the geology of something like the Carboniferous that itself underpins an entire industry that changes the face of a region 200 years ago and that leads to incredible stories like the one we covered on Britain at Low Tide for this episode, which really, really upset me, um, which was the tragedy at the Whitehaven coal mine. But all of this, I mean, you look at it, like the, bu <laughs> like the buildings are built from stone from the area. That stone came from somewhere. And you know, the men in those coal mines, the boys in those coal mines, were digging material that speak to the geology of times past as well. And that wouldn't have happened, that industry wouldn't have developed if it hadn't been for the circumstances that basically led us here over millions and millions and millions of years. 
I should say, actually, you might have spotted lovely Oliver, who was uh, one of my co-presenters on the programme. I met up with him in Sheffield earlier in this week. He's fine. If you're an Oliver fan, he's having a good time. In fact, in the interim, he has actually had a brilliant time. And uh, it was last seen, he told me, in, in France, he fought of a wolf with his bare hands. Honestly, I know. Anyway, that's Oliver for you. Um, so you sort of see this connection. You have a personal story, a history story, that to me is embedded in place. Like it's, not, it's, it's the communities, it's the people, but also the place itself speak in its very most fundamental way, not only into defining the landscape that we look at, but into basically defining the industries and the stories and the, and the history of humanity that is built upon it. So coming back to the viaduct and that connectivity, more beautiful pictures, there's Anne again. We were so cold. <laughs> it was colder here than it was in Siberia. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, I had two coats on and two pairs of trousers, and Anne wouldn't put her gloves on. So <laughs> like, anyway, there we go. Um, so <laughs> and yeah, the, the Solway viaduct story, I think, is really one of those like special like, aspects that sum up an entire region. So like, there you can see, look at that. I mean, it's so... There's something so very moving about seeing the end, like the end of an endeavour, a failed endeavour, sort of the hubris, if you like, of an industry, that, or a group of people who thought they could breach the, you know, the might of a river, who thought they could plunge their pylons into an incredible deep peat bog, and they, they, they just kept on pushing at it. They would drive their engines through it. It was nothing was going to stop them. No amount of damage or cost was going to be too much, but eventually, you know, nature got its own back. But, you know, when you look at it, you can't help but be a bit nostalgic, right? Because it is beautiful. It, it's wonderful. It's like the, 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 sort of the mirage aspect of those reflections, the kind of fine, spindly nature of the structure itself, like stretching across and connecting two communities. Like the, the powerful image of those two communities connected. And you know from Kia, like, you, know, you can't help but sense the fact this was an important connection point between two communities because of the energy and effort that people put in trying to get it to be reopened. So you see this incredible structure that kind of juts out like the prow of a ship. Like, I mean, it makes me think of Grecian temples. Again, civilizations long gone, but not as long as this. You see those rocks that are so distinctive of the area, and you know it couldn't really be anywhere else, to be honest. And then you imagine you know, that, that, that effort that was taken to build it, to stretch that whole mile across to Annan. And then you think about how it persisted for 50 odd years with trains going backwards and forwards and people connecting across that bridge and maybe having an easier connection between the two communities because it was there. And then you think to yourself, okay, well, you know, it must have been important because even once it broke, even once the fact that they could not afford to repair it because of all that damage caused by all those ice flows that kept crashing into it in those two big bad winters at the end of the 19th century, people still tried to persuade the railway company to reopen it because they wanted that connection between the two sides. They wanted to connect the north of the Solway communities and the south of the Solway communities because people want to be connected. They didn't rebuild the viaduct, but the communities did find a way to stay connected in that sense. Yeah, it, it, you know, people do always find a way. And I think, you know, that's what I like about this, really, when you then think about going around to the north and thinking about what the people, when they built that Powerfoot swimming must have been thinking. Because, you know, this was being built, we now know, thanks to work by people like Duncan Ford, that, um, you know, this was being built in 1899. So at this point, that poor viaduct was a, you know, a wreck. But it would have been still there in their landscape. The people who were walking <laughs> and having their holidays in Palfoot must have walked past and past it's kind of like you know the ruins of the viaduct and maybe still thinking what's going to happen next you know well they're going to fix it there must have been hanging in the air the, you know that feeling of you know of fear of like you know the changing industries and of course that's what Palfoot itself also represents doesn't it it represents the fact that oh okay I'm not sure that iron industry thing's working out very well <laughs> and um, maybe we should look at something else um, Maybe we should look to tourism. And, you know, and, and to the degree that people thought, let's invest an insane amount of money at that time in building this absolutely exquisite structure. I mean, it's just, it was such a, you know, it's, you know, such a grand projet for a, you know, a seaside resort in some respects. And you know, so you see, just across that one tiny little episode of television, you see the stretch of changes of the Solway. 
all of which we now interact with on a daily basis and also reflect in microcosm some of the discussions I've been hearing in the room throughout today. You know, wh what's important? What do we need to have you know, in the soul way at the moment? How do we balance the needs of nature and, and industry and environment and people and just making some money and having people come here and appreciating it? How do we get all those things together? They're not new issues. And in some ways, there'll continue to be issues probably for the next thousand years, as long as people are here, because the soulway will always change. But every single changing face is ultimately underpinned by the fundamentals of the landscape. And I think it will always be part of the story. And it's true here, it's true everywhere else. If you sort of stream out Britain at Low Tide, which was such, such a privilege to make, I have to say, you notice this repeated issue time and a time again that every part of the British Isles had its own story and so many of those stories were underpinned by the basic fundamentals of their landscapes so jetties in marshes at the side of, of rivers wonderful bits of bone and pottery that was actually in my backyard in Canvey Island near to where I grew up um, you know wonderful uses of rock pools and, and you know post holes in places lots and lots of mud lots and lots of mud ancient footprints that's Neolithic footprints um, up near uh, Formby, um, yeah, wonderful Second World War and even older, that's a, ooh, that's a medieval boat, I think. And yet, so you see these, these remnants of past industries that you know, have their connections because they're all coastal, but they also have their own individuality because every single region has a story and every single region's story is inherently tied to its landscape. And you can't separate the two. You can't leave one behind without the other. But also, you don't need to. You don't need to choose nature over people. You don't need to choose industry over environment. Really, the whole point is they aren't separate because they're all part, now that we're here, of the same story. You can't separate them. You have to intertwine them. And actually, the story they tell together is fuller, richer, more beautiful, and more inspiring for the people who come here than any other story you could try and tell. So I would say thank you for letting me come and listen to your conversations. I've been having a brilliant day. I was hiding in the corner listening to the workshop. I didn't take part, I listened to it. Some excellent points being made across the place. And I hope you all had a really worthwhile day talking to each other. Thank you.